Do you want to hear the voice? <laughs> All right. Charlie Brown approaches the football with anticipation of actually kicking it. And then it's, ugh! <laughs> Which has been the story of my life with women. <laughs> and then, of course, when I go trick-or-treating, this has also been the story with me and women. I got a rock. <laughs> Charles Schultz was from Minnesota. Of course. I think that's amazing. He, uh, he was born uh, 1922 in Minnesota, and um, was a, his first cartoon that was ever published was a cartoon he drew of his dog that showed up in a Ripley's Believe It or Not cartoon. He had written a letter that said that his dog would eat thumbtacks. <laughs> um, he said that dog helped inspire uh, uh, Snoopy. And what was the first special you worked on? Well, I was a child actor, and I had been on uh, F Troop, Munsters, Dragnet, Get Smart, Donna Richo. In other words, my mother would, uh, if there was an opportunity for a child actor to be in a show, um, I would try to uh, audition for it. Um, my sister, I followed in her footsteps, was um, in the movie Enter the Dragon. Oh, wow. I don't know if uh, any of you have seen that. The Bruce Lee movie. Yes. She's the, uh, she's the woman that brings in all the girls to the different uh, combatants. You know, she goes... Um, um, to uh, John Saxon's room and goes, uh, pick one. And he goes, I already have. And her line is, wise decision. So she, like me, have kind of um, one-liners, good grief being mine and <laughs> wise decision being hers. What, what's your sister's name? Anna Capri. Anna Capri, She's wow. She's one of the most beautiful actresses to grace... Um, Hollywood, and um, she had quite a nice career, and um, that was kind of her pinnacle was, uh, you know, getting to work with Bruce Lee, who yeah. was not only a martial artist, but probably one of the great charismatic um, people in cinema. Before we get to the Peanuts uh, story, you mentioned a bunch of shows there that I think are worth hearing about. Sorry, my mic. I might well stand at attention. Uh, you mentioned the Donna Reed show. What was that like? Well, everyone loved meeting Donna Reed. Of course, I'd seen uh, It's a Wonderful Life, and um, that is one of the mainstays of uh, um, Christmas. And I'd like to say that as a television show, A Charlie Brown Christmas is... Uh, a defining moment for people in Christmas time. It's been passed down to generations to generations. I get so many compliments of uh, my grandmother used to watch it, my mother used to watch it, now my kids watch it. So it's enduring, it'll, it'll go on and they will not have to pay me in per 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 perpetuity from what <laughs> I understand. But I am thrilled to death to be here because uh, Recently, um, I had some bumps in the road. I uh, suffer from bipolar one disorder and eventually got it treated to the fact that uh, I can now have a normal life and uh, get to meet my fans. So I would encourage everybody that knows a loved one <clears throat> that has this bipolar disorder to take it seriously and to get the treatment um, necessary to be functioning in life. That's great. I think it's a, it's a wonderful story that you're here, I think is just great, and I well, think. Well, in, in, in many ways, Charlie Brown, the character, has saved my life. And in that respect, 
I got a lot of fan mail um, telling me to keep my head up, that I would become a better person morally and spiritually through my uh, progression uh, actually in prison. And um, now I've learned to be grateful, thankful, and very respectful. Um, and that's what life is all about. Uh, I think we need to be more mm, respectful to our fellow man. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I think uh, you're an amazing success story, and I think it's, uh, I think it's fantastic to hear from. Thank you. Um, if people have questions, uh, if you can say them loud enough, good. Otherwise, I'll come down with a microphone. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about, if you have a question, though, just put your hand up. You do. You, you I know, can project. Let's hear what you got. Yeah, let's see what we can do. Let me try put this one over here as well. How's that? Ooh. Ooh. Wait a minute. Sorry. I'm a little bit out of practice. <laughs> Um, 1965, how old were you when Charlie Brown aired? I was nine years old, and I went on a cattle call. Originally, the producer, Lee Mendelson, went to elementary schools to try to um, get the voices um, for the airing of a Charlie Brown Christmas. Uh, Bill Melendez, the director, always insisted in having children play the voices, which uh, never really happened before. It was right. always adult yeah. playing children's voices. But he wasn't able to get Charlie Brown quite right or the voice of Linus, Chris Shea, just right. So he, he, he went to Hollywood. My agent was the same agent as Chris Shea. She specialized in children. So she sent us out for, I was going to try out for Charlie Brown in my mind, because that was, you know, yeah. <laughs> the lead character. And then there was the voice of Linus and Pigpen and Schroeder. Um, I lived in Newport Beach at the time, and I got kind of um, depressed when I read the script, because Christmas for me, living in Newport Beach, being the boy that let you know had the golden egg going around i had a <laughs> i had a pretty good christmas tree and i couldn't understand why anybody could be depressed during christmas and then i thought gosh i'm going to go back to school once this is aired and all the kids are going to call me a blockhead <laughs> which, which happened <laughs> <laughs> They would surround me with a bunch of kids, and they would go, say something. And i go, uh, say what? And they go, that's it. You know? <laughs> so, it, it. And it's been such a pleasure. Um, you know, you can be anonymous when you're uh, the voice of Charlie Brown. And, uh, you know, now that I'm 63, I can do a pretty good 63-year-old version of Charlie Brown. <laughs> it doesn't pay well, but... Um, <laughs> And, I, and I'm happy to do it for the fans because it has the same type of cadence. It has the same type of, um, I don't know how you would describe the voice of Charlie Brown. Lee Mendelson, the producer, said it was a blah, blah voice. I think it's a voice of uh, a young boy um, coming to grips with um, um, the, the opening line is, there must be something wrong with me, Linus. And I think at, at one point in all of our lives, we think, there must be something wrong with me. And uh, Linus, the great philosopher, says, Charlie Brown, you're the only one that can take a beautiful holiday like Christmas and turn it into a disaster. So, um, you know, as Charlie Brown confronts um, commercialism, like we all have, uh, you know, brought to you by a uh, uh, Eastern Syndicate, which was a play and a dig on the Feature Syndicate, which used to own the Charlie Brown specials. Um, and we seem to lose sight of um, 
the family and spending time with the family and enjoying Christmas, uh, just in my own life, um, it, it, it becomes um, uh, it becomes a lot of work to put together a Christmas dinner, and I think um, I think we should put that work into a Christmas dinner because it means so much and life is so short and. Um, family is uh, so precious and that's some of the things that I've learned um, being away so to speak in prison um, that, that family is important, freedom is important making good choices is, is, is very important and that's what I try to do on a daily basis is make the best choices I can. I'm very grateful that I get to meet the greatest fans in the world the fans of Charlie Brown, and I'm so happy that I, I, I'm, I'm a small part of the success of that um, television show. It's a Charlie Brown Christmas. Now, when, when you were cast, was it for Charlie Brown Christmas? Because I know they had done uh, some stuff on the Tennessee Ernie Ford show before that. Yeah, I don't remember that. Yeah, so it was it was the Christmas one was the first one you did, which was the first big special, right? It had been it had become this big phenomena. Yes. They put it together, you know, in a relatively short period of time. Yeah. Um, there were stories that um, when CBS saw the original cut, that they thought it was um, the animation wasn't good, that the voices were amateuristic. And I go, you know, nine-year-old, eight-year-old kids. Uh, right. How professional do you want them to be? Yeah, I understand it was a shoestring budget, and it was about six months that they took to produce it. It was sponsored by Coca-Cola. Yes. Which, uh, which is neat. And, and it was a huge hit. I mean, just, but at that time, Peanuts had gone from being, you know, just a, a strip in the paper to being dolls and toys and everything else. So when you were first reading for it, you're a little boy, was it something you were a fan of? No, I remember driving to the uh, audition and my mother just showing me um, a cover of the Sunday newspaper. Yeah. And that's how I started um, learning about Charlie Brown. After that special, you came back to voice Charlie Brown for more specials, right? That was not the only one. Right. I, I did it uh, 65 through 69. So you would have done, the next one they did was the summer of 66 was Charlie Brown All-Stars. Correct. And then the big one after that, which everybody remembers, was uh, um, It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Correct. Do you have memories of these scripts? I mean, do you remember, you know, like oh, yes. sitting there and recording them? Um, Bill Melendez, who was uh, the director, and he also directed a lot of the Walt Disney um, shows. I don't know if you know specifically which ones, but no, no. But uh, he... Snow White and they, they, yeah. they were able to grab him. So he would sit kind of like you would a little bit closer and he used to have these wonderful uh, handlebar mustaches which would fascinate me and um, he would say, you know, good grief, take one. And I would go, I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> good grief. But take two. Good grief. Take three. Good grief. You know, so it would go like that. Easy lines. Yeah. You know, not, not, you don't have to pontificate, but uh, Charlie Brown gets his message around. You know, uh, thank you for the Christmas card you sent me, Violet. I didn't send you a Christmas card, Charlie Brown. Don't you know sarcasm when you hear it? <laughs> No. So Charlie Brown, nine years old, dealing with Christmas and sarcasm and, you know, um, um, the lovable loser. Yeah. What was it like to work at that age? I always think about, like, if you're a kid and you're sitting there recording this stuff, would you rather be out playing with your friends? Is this, you know, how, how important is this to you at that time? Do you understand the magnitude of it? Well, I lived in Newport Beach, which was about an hour drive through traffic uh, to Los Angeles, Western Recorders, where the Doors used to record their oh, albums. Wow. So when I saw my mother uh, later when I became older, um, I kind of uh, resented the drive there, and that might have uh, um, helped uh, 
me being a little bit more uh, depressed in the voice. But the, the great thing about being the voice of Charlie Brown is uh, with the other shows, you didn't have to get up early. You didn't right. have to wear makeup. You didn't have to memorize your lines. They were all fed to you. So it was like, pretty simple. When you did the Munsters, right. uh, you show up on set there. There's a lot of people. They're under the gun to get you to record that right as quickly as possible, I guess. There's, sure. Whereas this, you know, it's just you and, and, and Bill Melendez and a microphone, right? Yeah, I had the opportunity to be on uh, some of the great shows that uh, Get Smart, uh, I remember rehearsing with uh, Don Adams, and it was directed by uh, Mel Brooks. So uh, I was always surrounded. Uh, I did an ABC TV movie with Olivia de Havilland and oh, Jason wow. Robards. And um, um, so I, uh, there was always uh, pressure, but the, the, the pressure was more on the stars, yeah. you know, the adults. Here's a question I have for you. Uh, the Munsters showed on television in black and white. Was the set in color, or was it, you know, where they were, was everything brightly colored, or was it not? It was uh, done in shades of black and white, and I remember meeting Fred Gwynn with those big boots, and just uh, the most amazingly sweet man uh, dressed up like Frankenstein, <laughs> you know? And then uh, Eddie Munster was very nice to me. I played his next door neighbor, and I think I was on the third episode where um, uh, Mr. Munster thought he was having a, a child, and it was a remote controlled doll that we were playing with. They, he thought that was his son. Oh, right. right. <laughs> so that's a, there was a long period of time that you're doing the voice of Charlie Brown. You do uh, The Great Pumpkin. Uh, the next one, 1967, you did uh, You're in Love, Charlie Brown. Yes. Um, your voice isn't changing at this point, right? There's no, uh, do you have to do anything to practice for this part? I mean, what is the, uh, what is the prep that goes into recording these? Your mom just takes you over there and you do it? Uh, we, we got uh, balloons of uh, helium. No, we didn't do that. <laughs> Uh, I saw the writing on the wall. The first person to be changed was uh, Linus, but he was lucky. He was changed by his brother, so they had the same kind of cadence and the right. same kind of lisp. And then Lucy was replaced, and of course uh, Sally had that incredible voice. You owe me restitution. Uh, <laughs> it's just a, a delightful voice. So uh, eventually. Uh, I was the last one to go. Yeah. Right after the movie, I believe. So uh, so you did He Should Dog Charlie Brown, where Charlie Brown uh, is tired of Snoopy's mischief and sends him back to the Daisy Hill puppy farm. Yes. Um, it was a short summer, Charlie Brown. Uh, this one was on TV September 27th, 1969. Uh, and the next one was uh, the theatrical film, which came out December 4th, 1969, which was a boy named Charlie Brown. So you did, this one was the last one where you were doing the voice. Yes. Um, movie must have been a little different, right? Did you go to the theater and see it? Yes, there was a premiere and a screening, and uh, we were all there uh, signing our autographs, and uh, I'm next to a bunch of uh, new faces, you know, voice, uh, Oh, of, uh, so you were the last one. So you're saying at the at the premiere, everybody else is not the same kid you had been. Another actress yeah. um, who had a pretty good reputation. She was also in a TV series, a Blondie TV series that I was on, Pamela and Ferdin, and she became the voice of Lucy in the movies. And um, she had a little. Um, she was a uh, an animal activist. And she actually took. Uh, uh, a cattle prod that they used to move the elephants to uh, the owner of the uh, Barnum and Bailey Circus. Right. And they, uh, they charged her with a felony, but after that kind of awareness, um, they stopped uh, touring with these elephants wow. and torturing so, them. So you're saying the cattle prod that they would use to move the ele elephants, she put one to the man that owned the well, circus. She went to uh, his uh, doorstep. Wow. Or gated house or whatever. And so you were on Blondie with her? I was on a TV series called Blondie with Will Hutchins and yeah. um, um, Jim Backus from oh, wow. uh, 
Gilligan's uh, Island. Gilligan's Island. Magoo, so yeah. that, that was a great thing. And I got to be in a movie with Sonny and Cher, which was fantastic. And I, they were the nicest people. The studio bought them his and her pink convertible Mustangs. You know, this is in the 60s, you know what I'm saying? And I remember uh, they were playing a song, one of Cher's and Sonny's songs. Uh, they say, I love won't pay the rent. Da -da, I got you, right. babe. And she's going, turn that crap off. <laughs> <laughs> so they were very humble. They were very sweet. They were a very, very dynamic couple. I met... Um, um, Sonny Bono, years later, when I, I lived in Palm Springs, and he was mayor of Palm Springs, and I had two sentences in the movie, and he goes, I go, I was in the movie with you called Good Times. And he said, and you were a fine, wonderful young actor. And I go, what, are you running for governor? <laughs> so, I don't know. He was a great guy. And, of course, it died in a tragic ski accident. And yeah. And uh, Cher just goes on. She she looks is fantastic. She's I mean she still puts out hits. She looks as good as her male impersonators. <laughs> um, I seem to remember around 2015 there was a an app that came out from uh, Peanuts that had your voice narrating yes. the story of yes. Charlie Brown's Christmas. Do you remember doing that and how they asked you to do that? How did that come about? Yeah, they said they wanted to come up with an app and I said, uh, the only way I'll let you do it is if you let me narrate it. <laughs> so they did. <laughs> I mean, that is great. They'll ask me sometimes, you know, the 50 greatest moments of um, Christmas. Everybody has a, uh, uh, a Christmas uh, special. Um, Charlie Brown was, uh, I think, uh, uh, in the top uh, three uh, at one time. Um, the Grinch Who Stole Christmas, which, you know, I said, you know, I want to recount. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen that, but whatever. And uh, I, I said, you can always use the clip, but I'd like to introduce it. Yeah. You know, and set the stage for what it was like. Uh, because, um, you know, uh, Charles Schultz is gone. Yeah. Bill Melendez is gone, and Lee Mendelson is uh, very old now. I don't know how active he is, but he, he was always active. And um, um, I'm just uh, happy and thrilled to be able to represent the voice of Charlie Brown. That has meant so much to so many people. And, uh, you know, if you want to come by and just say hello, I'd love to meet you. Um, if it's made some kind of impact in your life. I wanted to ask you about Charles Schultz. Sure. Did you, you met him, I'm assuming. Um, I guess he wouldn't have been there, though, much for the making of the TV special. I met uh, Charles Schultz um, about 20 years later, or maybe it was 10 years later, they were doing a show, and... Um, Phyllis George, remember her? She used to do the CBS football games. And uh, everybody was in love with Phyllis George. And that's when I first uh, kind of met Charles Schultz. And um, he basically just had approval of the voices. Right. He was never involved in the production. End right. Of, it. of course, he, he wrote an incredible script. Mm -hmm. And then there was incredible music. There was incredible direction. All the voices were perfect. Um, so I met him. He was very friendly, but, you know, he had a reputation of being a kind of a loner and a, and a, a doodler. Yeah. And he loved to, uh, to um, play hockey with his friends. He, oh, wow. he had a wow. museum and ice hockey yes. rink where he lived in Santa Rosa. Wow. So when you met him, you were, what, a teenager, an adult? When I met him, I was about... Um, uh, freshman in college, so I would have been about 18, 19. Wow, what was the, what was the occasion that you met him? And I mean, what did you? Did well, you... it was a, a special 10-year um, anniversary of a Charlie yeah. Brown Christmas. Wow. And now we're on a 53-year uh, yeah. celebration of a Charlie Brown Christmas. It's 
fantastic. I mean, it's just great. I, I mean, it is one, there's very few specials I know that are this way where everybody I know still watches it when it's on television. They all have it on DVD, you know, they all bought it on Blu-ray and they all still go watch it when it's on television every year. Every year I see, just recently the, the Halloween special showed, it was, everybody was tweeting about it. It's, it's something that I think it's the shared experience that everybody wants with that. Yes, I agree. It's like um, you can have It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, yeah. And uh, I watch it every yeah. Christmas Eve. Yeah. It's great. It, it's a wonderful. I wish we could talk about that longer. I wish you'd. Because <laughs> yeah. cause It's a Wonderful Life is such a, just such a, it's not really that Christmassy. If you watch it, you know, Christmas is only portions of the film. Much of the film takes place outside of Christmas. But it, the whole movie, just by the end of that whole roller coaster you go on, it's just such a beautiful story. Donna Reed uh, is so beautiful in that. You did mention that you worked with her and you had been Fascinatingly a Fascinatingly beautiful woman. Yeah. And so was um, uh, Shirley Jones. And uh, Carolyn Jones played my aunt in a movie called The Ticklish Affair. And um, Shirley Jones and Carolyn Jones were one of the most beautiful, nicest women you could ever meet. Oh, wow. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Well, Lee Mendelson, who owns the production, Lee Mendelson and Bill Melendez, they sell uh, the show uh, on a contract to CBS for X amount of years. Then CBS has a chance to renew it or they have a chance to renegotiate it. So now it's on ABC. Disney owns everything. <laughs> <laughs> I've. I'm surprised, by the way, that Disney has never gotten their hands on Peanuts. I've, I've never seen, I don't think they've done anything in connection with it. They haven't done one special or anything. Uh, it's one of the few properties that Disney hasn't seemed to purchase. Well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, over here first, and then we'll go over here. What's your name? Well, I, I heard about it like everybody else heard about it in the newspaper. And um, I didn't have a tremendous um, relationship or rapport with him. I mean, you know, I, I thank him for writing a great script, but I did not know him personally. I was more touched um, about in 2010 I decided to meet up with uh, Chris Shea, the voice of Linus. And uh, he lived in Eureka, California, and I lived in San Diego. So we decided to meet at a Tom Petty concert at the Oracle Arena in Oakland. And I went to pick him up, and he looked like the Geico caveman. He had Van Halen pants, and his hair was all out. And um, uh, we had a great time at the concert. And uh, a week later, he tragically uh, passed away from natural causes. And uh, that saddened me because uh, he was talking to me about doing events like this and, and maybe doing a comedy routine. He goes, should I cut my hair? And I go, why? <laughs> so. Um, that was that. That saddened me more than uh, the passing of Charles Schultz because uh, we had grown up as child actors together, and he had, w without Linus, uh, a Charlie Brown Christmas wouldn't be a Charlie Brown Christmas. Yeah. And without Linus, it's the Great Pumpkin. Is not. You know, it's like almost Abbott and Costello in a way. You know, it's a team. It's like Dean Martin, and. Um, Jerry Lewis, um, there was that rapport between him 
um, Charlie Brown, the depressed, and, and Linus, the philosopher. Right, and that was the first time in Charlie Brown Christmas that they read from the Bible. Yeah. And uh, he, di he did it so eloquently. And, uh, you know, the, the final message is uh, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. We had a question over here. What's your name? Well, we were all very excited about it. Um, one of the concerns that they had was, would they run out of material? Would it uh, become stale? Mm -hmm. And I think, as far as I'm concerned, um, that was my final hurrah, the, the, the boy named Charlie Brown. For those that don't remember, that's the one, Charlie Brown goes to New York City, uh, goes on a spelling bee. Yes, he can't spell the, his own dog's name. <laughs> and um, it was a modest box office success, made about $12 million at the time, which was, was pretty good for an animated film. Um, and it is, I mean, it, it is broken up with uh, Snoopy fighting the Red Baron, you know, so it doesn't play like a, you know, it doesn't feel as long as, it is a lot to go from, you know, doing a special that's 20 minutes you know, over a half hour to doing, you know, having people sitting down for an hour and a half. Um, you said you went to the premiere of that. Did you, did you ever go to any of these things or have a party at your house with, with other kids to, to watch any of this? Mm, occasionally. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned, you know, some of the kids uh, teasing you about it at school. Was it more, what, what was the ratio of, uh, of were, were there any kids that were really excited about it? Yes, but I went to a, a high school in Newport Beach, California, where everybody's kid came oh. from parents <laughs> that were well off. So I just had my little niche. I, people respected me. Right. Uh, they thought I was a good little child actor. Um, and I got a lot of parts because my mother was beautiful. Uh, you know, when you, go, <laughs> when you have a five or six uh, child actors and they're deciding who to pick, right. they always bring the mothers in because they don't want to have a stage mother disrupting the set. And then when my mother would walk in, she was a beautiful Hungarian woman, kind of like Green Acres. And they would just go, we have some good news for you, Peter. You got the part. <laughs> so, you know, you're a team when you're a child actor right. and, and your mother takes you. I mean, your, your mother then has to really devote her, her career is, is taking you to places to do things. And yes, correct. Um, and you say you were, so you didn't, because these were a lot of uh, voice roles, you didn't have to go to school on the set very often? Was that no. ever something it's you experienced? No, it's always done after school. Okay, good, good. Uh, questions? Yes, over here, what's your name? Well, my mother passed away when I was 16, so uh, I always had a backup plan. My dad was a prominent doctor in Los Angeles, and I was going to take over his practice. I went to the University of California at San Diego. I majored in pre-med, um, but I didn't have um, the necessary fortitude and skill uh, to become a doctor. So then I worked in the cable TV industry for quite some time, and then I went off to be a DJ at a rock station. 93.7 KCLB-FM, hear the Rolling Stones. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that gets a little old after a while, and then I managed an apartment or a motel in Sarasota, Florida, and then I ended up managing uh, some properties uh, that my father owned in the San Fernando Valley. 
right at the height of the total financial Bernie Madoff uh, collapse right. in 2007. But I have a lot of, uh, I have a little money stashed away and um, I'm rekindling my career. I'm going to write a book about my experiences called Confessions of a Blockhead. Uh, <laughs> That's great. That's perfect. And I'm hoping to have a happy ending. And, and my, uh, my goal to write the book is so I can meet Kelly Ripa. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have goals. Well, I followed in my sister's footsteps, who was an actress, and my mother would just take me out on interviews. I started off as an ivory soap commercial when I was eight, and then Mark's Toys, and then McDonald's, and then an episode on TV, and then my first uh, my mo major motion picture. And then uh, by the time I was nine years old, I was a pretty good diverse veteran child actor, and then I just got to get uh, lucky on this uh, Charlie Brown, which has lasted forever. But I can still see myself on uh, Get Smart, which will never uh, dissolve out That's of the good. consciousness, and, yeah. and Munsters, and uh, F Troop, which was a nice uh, F Troop show. was great. Yeah, Larry yeah, Storch. And get Smart, uh, did you work, who did you work with on that? I mean, you know, because, you know, every episode you're not necessarily working with every Well, actor. I worked with Barbara Feldman, yeah. and I worked with um, um, Don Adams. Don Adams, yeah. And um, it was supposed to be a reoccurring part, part but there's a philosophy um, in show business that yes. you don't play against. Children and animals? Children and animals. Because <laughs> they steal. And I was both. They steal. <laughs> 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 yes, we have a question here. What's your name? I'm Ingrid. Ingrid? Ah, what you thought of the recent CGI Charlie Brown movie? I didn't see it. Do we really need another remake of uh, Charlie Brown, a CGI version? I think Charlie Brown, or uh, Charles Schultz said when he passed away, no more movies, no more TV shows, no yeah. more strips, um, and yet they go ahead and do another movie. Um, you know, do you need another Munsters movie? Do you need another animated Adams Family? Can that yeah. really compare to Carolyn Jones and uh, um, who played the the main uh, lead? John, John Aston, yeah. John Aston. I mean. Uh, so, you know, Hollywood does these things. They, they make remakes and remakes and remakes, and if they can make $30, $40 million on it, then they can. Um, you know, I, it'd be like, uh, what does Sean Connery think of uh, all the 007s? <laughs> right. To me, there's only one 007, <laughs> Sean Connery. It's, it is interesting. Uh, a lot of comic strips will continue after the creator passes away, but Charles Schultz retired, uh, and his last strip came out the day he died um, right. in 2000, and he had said he didn't want the strip to continue. They could run you know, older ones, and it is an evergreen story. Charlie Brown, you know, it wasn't like Charlie Brown was playing with his CB radio, and, and it wasn't like he you know, got a computer. And, yeah, I mean, Charlie Brown had a very basic evergreen story that works forever. Yes. Um, of all the Charlie Brown specials you worked on, which one is your favorite? Charlie Brown Christmas. Let's see, any questions from here? Uh, yes, you in the back, what's your question? What's your name? Trevor. Uh, Trevor. No, I mean, they all, there was a ton of them that aired. They aired so many more than I think people remember. Like, we all remember uh, the, the uh, Great Pumpkin, and everybody remembers um, the Christmas one. But, like, they did, um, you know, like, look, they did this one with, like, Snoopy on Ice. It was like a TV special with a costume, Snoopy. There was, uh, you're, not, you're in the Super Bowl, Charlie Brown, at one point. Um, elected Charlie Brown. Yeah, there were a lot of... Uh, 
Like someday you'll find her, Charlie Brown. I mean, in October of 1981. They, I mean, it was such a popular concept that I think what they would do is they'd put out these new ones and then they'd still run the old ones because the, the classic ones, you know, were the ones that people still wanted to see. They wanted to check out that new one once, but they wanted to watch that classic one every year. Uh, any other questions? Um, I think we're almost out of time. What other, what other thoughts do you have? Do you have anything you want to tell everybody? I just want everybody to know that I am thrilled, happy, grateful to be in Minnesota. And I look forward to uh, shaking each and every one of your hands. And uh, I just want you to know that I feel the love of Charlie Brown and this character has saved my life. Thank you That's all. That's great. That is wonderful.